This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. Because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Hello there, Duke fans, and welcome to episode number 564 of the Duke Basketball Roundup. We are here to preview this weekend's game, the first game of the ACC season for the Duke Blue Devils. They will head down to Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, to take on the Georgia Tech Yellow Jackets. Before we get into the preview, we're also going to talk a little bit of basketball personnel changes, and also we'll talk a little bit of football because we got to talk some football these days. Before we get into all that, I am Donald Wine. I'm your host for this episode. I have Jason Evans, the resident AT alien, who is going to the game this weekend. Jason, there you go, how baby. Are you? I'm doing great. I'm really looking forward to seeing Duke in person. I haven't had a chance to do that yet this this year. Uh, uh, it's always fun, by the way, going to see the Blue Devils play Georgia Tech because I get to see so many of my Atlanta Duke friends there. Uh, if this is typical of past of recent seasons, then stadium will probably be about forty percent, maybe fifty percent. Folks in blue as opposed to folks in yellow. Uh, we have a good time taking over uh, down here in, in Atlanta. And uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it should be, it's an important game. It is a, you know, I'll tell you when, when the schedule came out, I didn't see this game and, and go, wow, this is one where the devils really need it. I feel like based on the way the team has played in recent weeks to start this season, frankly, this is a pretty darn important game. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think when you talk about this game, first of all, like I said, it's the first game on the ACC slate, you want to start out one and zero in the ACC. You don't want to put yourself behind the eight ball immediately, but also it's on the road. It's coming off of another road game where we lost. Also, we're going to talk really quickly. Georgia tech just came off of a big win at home. So they are going to be, you know, bouncing and ready to go. And like you said, Jason, even though the, the stadium is going to have a lot of Duke blue in there, there's still going to be loud. It's still going to be people wanting to see us go down in Georgia. So let's get into the preview for Georgia Tech. They're three and two on the season. They have wins uh, against Georgia Southern by 22. They also beat Howard by three. And as I mentioned, uh, just just the other night in the ACC SEC challenge, they beat Mississippi State by eight, which I thought was one of the better wins for the ACC in that challenge. Now, they do have two losses on the season. One of them is to UMass Lowell, which is not a great team. Uh, they lost by three at home. But then I think it, Arguably, that might have been. Donald, did, did you say UMass Lowell? I mean, Lowell. My, my goodness. Not even Amherst. Come on, man. Lowell. Um, they're, they're not great. But, Jason, that might not be the worst loss that they have. I think the worst loss is they went to Cincy, and they just got belt stomped by 35. Now, before I give it to you for advanced metrics, I just want to talk a little bit about what we saw in a couple of these games. against Cincinnati, I think the one thing that Georgia Tech did is they shot terribly in that game. They also turned the ball over. They had 19 turnovers in that game. They shot like 30% from the floor, Uh, 37% from three, uh, from two, 29% from three. Meanwhile, since he only had six turnovers and they shot very well against UMass Lowell, everything on the stat line was very similar except for one stat, free throws. Georgia Tech made them. UMass Lowell didn't. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. Georgia Tech went 56%. They missed everything while UMass Lowell made almost everything. They went 86%. So I think for Duke, you can't go cold. you got to embrace the intensity that is going on the road. Again, Georgia Tech. We've lost to Georgia Tech on the road. I I know we talk about how usually Duke-loving it is because there's a lot of Duke fans that make it into the building down in the Cambridge Pavilion. But look, you got to make sure you start off hot. 
not just from the floor, but also just intensity and energy to make it where the any momentum that can be built by Yellow Jackets fans is at a minimum. So with that, Jason, I'm going to let you take most of this because you were going to be in the building, but also Georgia Tech, as, as we mentioned, you're the AT alien. Georgia Tech is in your backyard. You get to watch a lot of Georgia Tech. And I know you've seen some of them so far, not as much as we normally would because our season's been pretty busy. But talk about the Yellow Jackets, what you've seen from them so far. So you mentioned the schedule a little bit, and I just want to add one thing to it. Uh, you know, they barely beat Howard. And, and you mentioned the, the loss to UMass Lowell, the getting just curb stomped by Cincy. And then to turn around and beat Mississippi State, a ranked Mississippi State team, in, in a game where they led by double digits almost the entire second half, it's like, it's like so a complete, complete 180. It's like, a, yeah, like this Georgia Tech team, uh, like two different, Jekyll and Hyde. And I don't know which Georgia Tech we're going to see. They, they've mostly been Hyde. Um, I guess is Hyde bad or is Jekyll? Hyde is bad. Jekyll's good, right? Yeah. Okay. They've mostly been Hyde this year, but they, they were most assuredly Jekyll when it, when they played Mississippi State the other day. I hope that Duke does not get the Jekyll version of Georgia Tech. Because this Georgia Tech team is currently ranked 135 in Ken Palm's advanced metrics. They're 150th on offense and 145th on defense. Donald, that says they're equally mediocre at both offense and defense. They they play a moderately fast tempo. They're not super fast, but they're they're not a team that's looking to milk the shot clock down to the very end of the shot clock. Um, in terms of their offense, you you alluded to this. They're a terrible, terrible shooting team. 305th in the country at effective field goal percentage. That's because they hit less than 30% of their threes and only 45% of their two point shots. Frankly, they aren't even good at free throw shooting only 65% of their free throws. This is a bad shooting Georgia tech team. They are good. The one thing they do well on offense is offensive rebound. They are grabbing about 36% of their missed shots, which is a really, really nice offensive rebounding percentage. I think what happens is they miss so many shots so badly that there are long rebounds and such that Georgia Tech gets them. And that good rebounding is largely thanks to 6'7 uh, senior Tazon Claude, who came over from Western Carolina. I think I'm pronouncing his name right there. He is only 6'7, but he plays really hard in the post. He's not easy to push around. And he is a guy who gets in position to get rebounds very, very nicely. Uh, they do a decent job, by the way, of getting to the free throw line as well. On defense, Donald, do you remember what we saw when we played Arkansas and they were blocking lots of shots? Mm -hmm. I have bad news for you, my friend. The best thing that Georgia Tech does on defense is block shots. They've got a lot of guys who are shot blockers, including several guards who are good shot blockers. They are excellent, Georgia Tech is, at defending the three-point line. They allow their opponents to hit just 28.5% from three-point range. Man, I, I will be one frustrated dude if Duke is Duke is again shooting in the you know mid to low twenties on three pointers. But that's what Georgia Tech is really good at doing. When they played Michigan State the other day, Michigan State was only seven of thirty from three point range. That's that's a lot of three point shots to take. Thirty is a ton, and they only hit seven of them. And this this is a Georgia Tech team that you know in terms of turnovers, they don't really force a lot of turnovers. They don't make a lot of turnovers. Just sort of, you know, it's yet again something that they're kind of just average at. And it's worth noting as we begin to get into, you know, who the players are here and just the size of the team. This is not a Georgia Tech team that's very big. They've got, you may remember, uh, 6'11", Ebenezer Dewuna, who, who was at NC State the past several years. He's transferred now to Georgia Tech. He's been getting some time for them lately. But other than him, they don't really have anybody who stands taller than 6'7", who's going to get minutes. But... They've got a lot of mid-range guys, a lot of guys like between 6'5 and 6'7 who all fight really hard on the boards. And it's a Georgia Tech team that may seem undersized, but they do not back down at all. Uh, you, Ken Pomeroy says that Duke's going to pick up their first road victory of the season in this game. He expects Duke to win 81-70. to 70. Donald, should we get into players? Should we talk a little bit more about the guys that that uh, seem like they will be factors for the, for the Yellow Jackets? Before we do that, I want to. I have a question for you. you. Let's go back to the beginning. You mentioned that they're not a good shooting team, and that they're right. you know one of the bottom sixty in in effective field goal percentage. Now, when I saw the UMass Lowell game, at least like the highlights of it, they shot seventy times. That's a lot of shots. 
is this a volume shooting team that's just like, hey, we know we're going to miss, so we're going to just put up as many shots as possible and hope this happens? Or is this just effectively this team is just not good at shooting the basketball? They, they are not good at shooting the basketball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they do take a lot of shots, and that's a function of of them. Like I said, they, they don't turn the ball over a tremendous amount of the time, and they're a good offensive rebounding team. You put those things together, and you're going to get a team that's going to end up taking – a lot of a lot of shots but like like they're led by miles kelly um who was you know a team leader for them last year he he he's averaging close to 20 points per game this season he takes close to a third of their shots like when he's on the floor you can count on that guy to be putting up the ball he only hits 40 percent of his two-point shots and only 28 percent of his three-point shots like this is a dude who loves to shoot but is not very good at it um but the reason he's averaging close to 20 points per game is because he's good at getting to the free throw line. He takes more than seven free throw attempts per game. Like he'll put it on the floor. He'll force you into bad position and then he'll get fouled. And he goes to the free throw line a lot. Um, but uh, you so know, the James the Harden school, the James Harden school of basketball. Yeah, exactly. Right. The only guy, there's one guy that I saw that you should not let shoot. And that's Dallin Coleman. He hits about 45% of his three pointers. He is far and away their leading three-point shooter. There's no one else in this team that hits better than 33% of their three-pointers. The rest of the guys are just not good three-point shooters. But if you if you don't let Dylan Coleman shoot, and if you let Miles Kelly shoot a lot but not let him get to the free throw line, that's probably a formula for success for the Blue Devils. Look, I, I think just overarching looking at some of these players, right? Georgia Tech is a team... I feel like every time we play them, we don't know what Georgia Tech team we're going to expect. And we also don't know what Duke team we're going to expect. I think, was it last year, Jason? We went down to Georgia and beat them by like 40. And it was just like, I know you were down there. You're like, this is great. Like, yeah, game, game was game was over early. It was game fun. was yeah. game was over at the like under eight media timeout in the first half. Like it was a, it was a and then we've had games before. I've I, when I was down there, we won fairly handily, but it took. 35 minutes for that to be the case, right? We, Georgia Tech kept hanging in there. They kept they kept doing a lot of these shots and they kept making them. And again, I go back to this mentality of keep the momentum at a minimum. Keep the crowd out of it. Keep it where, where again, they're figuring out what to do and where, you know, what their order is at the varsity as opposed to the fact that they're going to be maybe, you know, storming the court. I I look at this game and I it's almost like I don't want to say I don't care about the players because I I do and I think I, I respect Georgia Tech and how they play. I think the issue is like what will the real Georgia Tech please show up and will the real Duke please show up so we can figure out what this game's going to be like because this is this is going to be a game where there's going to be so many intangibles at play and Duke needs to try and figure out a way to win those intangibles to win this game. I'm I'm so glad you mentioned Duke because I I do want to just very briefly say that I feel like we need to see some urgency from Duke, specifically from our sophomores. Great point. I, I, I you know, I, I'm, I'm going to be delicate here, as delicate as I can be. There's talk, rumors, if you want to call it that, that Duke sophomores, for the most part, are looking ahead to what comes next in their careers. That they are not focused on the now, that they're focused a little too much on, oh, what what's my draft stock look like? Which team might be pick, taking me in the NBA next season? And these guys are not playing defense the way they should. They're not displaying the right mindset when it comes to respecting their opponents. They don't seem to think that Duke's going to get everyone's best shot every single day, which frankly, when Coach K was at the helm, you knew was the case. Duke was going to get your best shot, but Duke was prepared to get your best shot. And I, I, I don't want to be too mean to them, but I feel like these guys who are now in their second year in the program are they sh they should be better prepared. They should be able to match the intensity of the opponents better than they have been this season. I'm not just talking about the Arkansas game. I'm not just talking about the Southern Indiana game. I'm talking about a number of games that Duke has played this year where it just doesn't feel like our experienced players are playing the way they should. The experienced players, the as I mentioned in the last show, the inconsistency of the experienced players is what we were not prepared for this season. We were expecting them to be even keeled, understanding what this was going to be like, and that the freshmen can have their ups and downs and that'd be fine because they weren't going to be put in positions where they had to run the team as unlike previous years where, you know, it's been freshmen that have been, you know, the majority of teams that we've had. Now we're talking about figuring out how to 
to eliminate the inconsistencies of the guys who have been here before. And that's not something we've had to deal with in a long time. And, and that's where I think the most improvement can come. So if, if, if Jason, if you and I are, are able to challenge quote unquote. Yeah. Let's team, call them out, man. Do it. Let's call them out. It's not even yeah. call them out. But you're like, I challenge the players who have been here for these experienced players. I challenge them to bring some consistency to the table against Georgia tech, because if they can, you're you're going to have your varsity order in before halftime because you'll you'll or you'll be back home. You'd call the wife and say, "Hey, look, you know, I'm coming home early because this game is done." I dude, dude I got like I got to stick around for the post game press conference. I got to get in the locker room and talk to guys. But at least you'll <laughs> at least you'll have a time. You'll have a time frame. You'll you'll be able to plan yeah. your plan your yeah. afternoon as opposed to you know figuring out oh no how am I going to get up out of here uh, because everyone's storming the court. But the consistency needs to be there. That's been what's missing the most. And that's where the improvement can come the quickest. And so I challenge this team to figure out where that consistency lies and go get it. But by the way, the SEC championship game, Georgia, Alabama is happening just a couple miles from the Georgia tech stadium. Mm -hmm. And when the Georgia, once the game ends, I'm going to head to the locker room, I'm going to head to the post game press conference and then I'm hustling as fast as I can to get out of there before traffic gets too crazy. I'm really worried. I'm getting there's a lot. There's going to be a lot of red going to uh, Atlanta. <laughs> be a lot, exactly. A lot, a lot of red and a lot of maroon or what crimson, I guess they call it. Crimson. Um, hey, last thing I want to mention as we preview Georgia tech before we move on, it is worth noting Georgia tech has a new coach. Damon Stoudemire is now in charge of that program. This is a guy who's experienced in the coaching ranks. He had several pretty good seasons at Pacific. They, they were, that was a program in real trouble. And he built them up to a point where they were playing pretty well. They had a year, they won like 24 games, something like that, which is really good at Pacific. He then left sort of shockingly in the middle of a season and went, cause he got a, a assistant head coaching job at the Boston Celtics. And he was on the Celtics bench for several years. And then Georgia tech came calling and he came back. Look, this is a guy who knows good basketball. Damon Stoudemire was a great college player at Arizona, like, you know, in the running for national player of the year. He then went on to the NBA where he won an NBA rookie of the year and had a very long, very successful career there. He knows coaching. I think that he's probably going to do a really good job with this Georgia tech program over the course of time. I, you know, I don't know that they're there yet, but we should mention folks, you'll see someone different on the sidelines. Josh passner has gone. Damon Stoudemire is there. And, and I think if you're, if you're someone who's interested in the Georgia tech program, um, Damon Stoudemire is a nice hire. I, I think tech did a good job on that one. Yeah, I I I love I love Damon Stoudemire when he was he was playing in uh in the NBA. I, I didn't necessarily care for him in college because he went to Arizona and you know we didn't care about Arizona back then. Um, but I, I did care about the fact that he was he was a very, very good player. He was great in the NBA and so far in his coaching career, he's shown that he can take guys and coach them up, which is kind of what Georgia Tech has needed for a while. Josh Pastor kind of had that for a little bit and then lost it, which is why he's now uh in the studio for ESPN. But I, I think, you know, if he's able to coach up some of these guys, that's what I'm most afraid of for this particular Georgia Tech team. If they're coached up, they can come out and, and really, you know, again, light up, light up the scoreboard. And if they do, that puts more pressure on Duke and these players uh, to be consistent and come through and win. But I do think, Jason, that having said all that, I do think that we will rebound. I think we will recover. I think we have learned, hopefully, from uh, this loss the other night against Arizona or against Arkansas. And even the loss against Arizona and learn some of these mistakes and understand what the mentality needs to be when you walk into the ACC. That is where we need our captains to shine. That's where we need our upperclassmen to shine. And again, that's where we need the freshmen to understand, hey, we're walking into a big moment. It may not be the glitz and glam of the Champions Classic, but this game is, is going to be lights out and we need to be ready to go. So again, that is going to be Saturday afternoon. It's an afternoon game. Jason gets, like you said, Jason gets to go gets to see some see some basketball before the football. But uh, we will leave it right there. On the other side, we're going to talk a little bit more basketball, some personnel changes coming uh, or already happened in the Duke program, and also the update on Duke football, where we are at, who's staying, who's leaving, and where we're at as a program after this. Why take one vacation with the family when you could take all of them? With Royal Caribbean, you don't just go to the beach. You visit a private island and race down the tallest water slide in North America. You don't just go for a road trip. You ATV and zip line through the jungle. You don't just go somewhere new. You rappel down waterfalls and discover ancient temples. 
because this isn't just any vacation. This is all the vacations. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry, Bahamas. Okay, we are back and we're staying with basketball for right now. We are talking about some personnel changes that have happened within the program in the last couple of days, two or three days, just before the Arkansas game, it was announced that Justin Robinson, friend of the podcast, longtime friend of the podcast, former Duke player, had that magical run in 2019, 2020, where he just became one of the best players in college basketball. It felt like right before COVID struck. He, it, we had talked about him just a couple of weeks ago, Jason, on the, he was on the Brotherhood podcast and talked about him playing in Israel just a couple of weeks ago, about a month or so ago, when all you know everything happened with the Hamas attacks, he came back to the United States, and now he is back with the program. He is the director of player personnel. I think this is a great move. We've talked about his, you know, his ability to just be such a lovable teammate. How, you know how, and the fact that he has probably had the best, you know, toughest assignment of a college player in history. Uh, the guys he had to guard and practice for five years but also talked about just how he wanted to get into coaching and how that was his passion and how he's been trying to figure out a way to get into the coaching ranks. And this is the first step. A lot of these guys who've become assistant coaches, not just here, but elsewhere have started with that director of player personnel position more famously recently held, I believe by Emil Jefferson, who then became an assistant coach and now is with the Celtics. So Jason, what do you got on, on Justin Robinson? First of all, I, I know we're both happy for him and glad to see him back in the program. Yeah, first of all, you got his title wrong, man. He's the director of player development. And player there development, is no me. one. Yeah. There is no one I can think of who would know player development better than a lightly regarded walk-on, a guy who didn't even get very many division one offers, who comes to Duke and by the time his career is done, he becomes the star of the final few games of his career, including a contest against UNC where he was clearly the player of the game. Um, you don't get more development than that, my friend. <laughs> And, and he he knows what it takes to get better, to work harder. He knows what it takes to work in practice and develop your game by playing against the best. I think he is so ideally suited for this job. Like, there's not a lot to say here because we already talked about it a little bit when we were talking about his appearance on the Brotherhood podcast. Shout out Ryan Young, doing a great job there, Ryan. Uh, and and J-Rob, there's nothing nothing more to say than thrilled that he's going to be a part of this program. I think he has the exact right attitude. He has the temperament and it feels like the kind of player who is going to be just so useful for the current players and someone who's going to eventually mold himself into being a fine, fine coach. And it doesn't suck to have a little bit of basketball royalty back involved with the program. His daddy, if you haven't heard of this, you may have heard of this guy, Justin Robinson's father is David Robinson. Look him Who's up. He? Yeah. If you, if you haven't if you haven't seen the Admiral play, go ahead and look him up because that dude, one of the greatest of all time at the center position. And I'm just thrilled to have Justin back in Durham involved with the program again. Look, J Rob is one of the all time nice players, like like just from an attitude perspective and in, in Duke history, in my in my opinion, his dad, one of the all time classiest guys in basketball history, just anytime he was in Cameron, he would stop. He, there'd be times where he could move three feet because he would just stop for every single picture to shake every single hand, to talk with people, you know? So if this means that David Robinson is coming back to camera more, I am 100% for it just on that alone. But I think with Justin Robinson, the fact is again, Jason, I think the one thing that he can even help the most with is those bench players. Those, those not, you know, like Spencer Hubbard, Tyler uh, uh, Borden, those Stanley Borden, those type of guys, because remember he was that guy. Right. He was the guy that came on. He was a prefer preferred walk on and he was drawn with some tough assignments and his object. He said, my job was to get them better. And in the process, I got better, too. That is what player development is all about, because you never know if one day Stanley Borden might need to step into the fray and, and make a play. You want him to have the confidence to do so. And Justin Robinson is the one guy who can teach all of these players, not just the, the guys at the end of the bench, but the guys on the front of the bench and in the starting lineup. He can teach all of them about that confidence of being ready when your number is called, which is something that we've had to deal with so far this year. So congratulations to Justin Robinson. 
we hope to we hope to have you back on the on the pod at, at some point. Uh, I know we've reached out to uh, to Duke to try and get you get you back on, but if you're listening, congratulations from us. We we're, we're so proud and and glad to have you back in the program, Jason. Let's move to the gridiron because we've had a lot happen this week. Uh, so we want to give a quick update on where we are at this point. As of this recording, we do not have a coach. Uh, we Dina King is still interview or starting the process of interviewing people. I know there's been some names that people have reportedly uh, that has reached out that we've spoken to not can get to all those names because at this point it doesn't really matter, but what is wait, wait, Donald, Donald, I, one yes. thing I will say about the names really quickly and all these articles that are out there saying, Oh, here's the name of these guys and stuff like that. There was an article in the athletic that listed several names and I usually trust the athletic. I was like, Oh, this is probably really accurate. But the article finished with them saying also former Dallas Cowboys coach, Jason Garrett is in the mix. The moment I read that in the article, I went, okay, you don't know what you're talking about because I've heard from people. <laughs> Jason Garrett is not in the mix. Jason Garrett happens to love Duke basketball and has attended Duke basketball games over the years and uh, apparently feels a connection to Duke University. And that's great. I love it. And there's nothing wrong with Jason Garrett, but I've heard from multiple sources, Jason Garrett is not involved in the current coaching search at Duke. So if you read an article that lists names and includes Jason Garrett, then no offense, but you know the person who wrote the article maybe doesn't know what they're talking about, or just throwing names out there for the sake of again yeah, conversation or discussion. Because if you remember, if you remember, you know, a couple years ago when we hired Mike Elko, Jason Garrett was thrown into that because on Sunday Night Football, someone mentioned like, "Hey, you're a Duke basketball fan, don't you? Don't you want to go coach again?" He was like, "Yeah, you know, I'd be open to you know a conversation," and that turned into Jason Garrett as the front runner uh, to take over at Duke. For like a week, it was like that until, you know, everyone's like, we never even spoke with him. So, yeah, he's not a he's not a candidate. And it doesn't really matter who like all they've talked to, because it seems like that they they're at the point where it's very broad. They've, they've talked to a lot of a lot of people at this point. What is something that we can report right now is about who has, is about to leave the program. And we've had a couple of guys that have exited via the transfer portal or who have decided to enter the transfer portal. Cash Watkins, who most of you don't know because he redshirted this year. He did not play a single down. Uh, he had rehabbed from an injury that he sustained in high school. He set out this year. He did. He was the first to say that he was going to enter the transfer portal, followed closely by Nias Peoples, who uh, was dynamite for Duke this year. We're really going to miss him. He, he, but he had been here four years. Great He's defensive as a grad transfer. Really great defensive lineman. Great yeah. defensive lineman. Had a lot of sacks, a lot of tackles for loss. We're really going to miss him. A guy that can play on Sunday. So wherever he is, I know he's going to to be a star. The one that is the, the I guess, not necessarily the backbreaker, but the biggest one in a lot. Gut punch, really, baby. It really is a pain. Yeah. It's a gut punch is Riley Leonard. Riley Leonard announced that he is entering the portal. He has put a no contact tag on his entrance into the portal, which means that teams cannot contact him, but he can contact teams. And it sounds like, according to a lot of the reports, that Notre Dame is the the front runner to land his services for next season. I know Auburn is in the mix. Some have even hinted about Alabama and, and Texas A&M, but I don't think they're really uh, in the mix. I think it's really Notre Dame followed by Auburn. But Jason, the reason why I talk about those three guys, and we, we, we'll talk about, you know, of course, Ryan Leonard in a second, but the reason why it's just three is we have to tip our hat right now to Nina King because we mentioned when Elko left that the first thing Nina King said was that she had talked to the players that are currently on the team to let them know what the process was going to be like. She had reportedly told the players that they were going to hire a coach within 10 to 12 days. That was the That's been the running report. But also she talked with the committed recruits that have not yet signed because the signing day doesn't open until the 20th, I believe. They and their families had a meeting virtually with Nina King. And Nina King has been working with Trooper Taylor, who's the interim coach, and a lot of the coaches that have stuck around. They are going to, you know, basically door to door, so to speak, to these uh, to these homes of these uh, players to keep them on board. And so far, almost all of them have come out and said, hey, Nina King has done a great job at reassuring us that everything's going to be OK. Reportedly, Duke has said, hey, if you sign, we are going to honor your scholarship no matter what, what happens with the coach and whether they they like you or don't, you will still have a scholarship to get a four year degree from Duke University, which I think is great. The same went with the players that are already here, that they said, hey, no matter what, we are going to honor our commitment to you. We're going to do right by you. And a lot of people who have been talking throughout this process so far, and the process has been fast, 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 
but everyone has remarked on how great Nina King has been handling what is a very difficult situation, not just for her, but for her team, her staff, her athletic department, and for this university and for the football program. So I just wanted to throw that out there and say, hey, you know, that Nina is doing a great, great job trying to keep this together while they, at the same time, go out and find the person who's going to assume the helm of head coach for the future of Duke University. Yeah, so there are two comments I have on all this. The first one is, yes, Nina King is doing a great job in these early stages, but she will be judged on how quickly and who, time and person. We need her to fill this position fast, and it needs to be the right hire because as good a job as she's done on saying these guys, don't leave yet. You know, here are all the different things that we're going to do to make things right for you. If they don't get the right hire in place, you're going to start to see more and more guys enter the transfer portal. And you're going to see some of these recruits who have not committed yet, you know, who verbally committed but not signed on the dotted line. You're starting to see some of those guys start to question their commitment to, to, to the Blue Devils. She's talked about, I think she talked about a 12-day process, like saying, I'm going to get this done in 12 days. I'll be honest with you. I'd love it to be like six. <laughs> it's uh, what's been three we're already on three, we're already on yeah. three or four. On three. Right? I, yeah. I, I'd love, please let there be talk that Duke is signing someone that Duke has got their coach in place by the end of this weekend. That would be the ideal because when the transfer portal opens, you want there to be a coach here at Duke who can immediately start to hop on some of that and, and, you know, help restock this roster. Also, Jason, Another big thing that not necessarily dealing with the portal, but another big thing that happens this weekend is on Sunday, all the bowl announcements come out. Exactly. Uh, and, and so that is going to be, if you kind of, Jason, you know, if we, if we hear on Friday or Saturday that Duke is in the, you know, Duke is in talks with X person to become their next head coach. That is a great sign because that will help reassure some of these bowl committees that may be deciding between Duke and other schools that, hey, Duke's got their stuff together and that we we, sh we shouldn't have any worries about bringing, in, bringing them in for this bowl game because they're not going to have a depleted uh, war chest, so to speak. Last thing I have on football. When Mike Elko took this job, even though David Cutcliffe had had some success, there was a perception that Duke was not a job where you could win. I'm just going to be honest about that. Uh, you know, again, Cutcliffe had had a few good seasons, but for the most part, the past 30 years since Steve Spurrier left the Blue Devils, we were a program that was considered one of the worst in all of Power 5 football. And I know there are a lot of Duke fans who are upset that Mike Elko left. I know that we chimed in and said we were upset at the way he left and the things he said and did in those final hours that he was Duke coach or you know, as he was becoming Texas A&M coach. But there is one thing that we should very, very much thank Mike Elko for doing, and that is for dispelling the notion that you cannot win at Duke. This Duke team was ranked for much of this past season. Last year, they won nine games. It is clear that Duke players, that the kids that Duke recruits can go on and play on Sundays and be successful playing in the NFL. And Mike Elko is a big part of that. And when Nina King goes out, and starts talking to people about coming to take over the Duke program, those guys are not going to feel like they're taking over a program where winning is impossible. They're going to, and we should thank Mike Elko for this. They're going to feel like they're taking over a program where being ranked, playing in significant bowl games, maybe even playing in a playoff champion, you know, in, in, in the national championship. Now that we're going to 12 teams, look, Duke was ranked in the top 15. I think we, we, we got, right up to the cusp of it at, at some points this year. Mm -hmm. It is not outside the realm of possibility for this Duke program. And, and you know, uh, I dumped on Mike Elko the other day, but we do owe him that. Look, Jason, we're, we're only a decade removed from being in the ACC championship game, right? Like we, we've had recent success in a very difficult conference and you people can talk all they want about how weak or, or strong the ACC is relative to other people. But it's it's a, it was a strong conference back then, and that team rattled off a bunch of wins to get to the title game and lose to you know a, a team that was coming off the national championship. This time around, Jason, we were we're seven and five, and we've talked on this show about the number of those five losses that easily could have been wins if one thing had gone right or wrong. Fourth and sixteen, Riley Leonard getting hurt, Beeling getting hurt, you know. 
Graham Barton missing. Like those, we had a lot of injuries. We had, you know, the UNC game, I'm going to talk about that disaster but, uh, from, from the referee's perspective. But we've had instances over the last two seasons where even nine and three, you know, nine and four last year, whatever we were, could easily been 10 or 11 because we had a couple of plays here and there that made the difference in those games. We didn't, we didn't get blown out. We only got one game this year where we really were like outmatched. And that was probably the Louisville game where we didn't score a point. Everything else we were in it at some point, even Florida state, I know they pulled away, but we were in it for a lot of that football game, at least had a chance to, you know, do a play here and there to win the game. That is what they're getting. That's what this next coach is getting. And hopefully, and that's what this, this, you know, I keep harping the bull. I, I, I talked about my, my experience with the football team on the last show, but I never, I never will take a bowl game for granted. I hope that 10 years from now that we as a fan base in a way are taking bowl games for granted that we're like, Oh, we made it to the belt bowl. I like, what? Well, that's it. Like I, I, if that we, if we're doing that, that means our, program is elevated to the point where we can sort of get snob snobby about where we end up in bowl season and the fact that we think that we should be contending for championships not just to be in the hunt or or you know one play away so we're right there we we've started a nice little process it began with Cutcliffe it continued with Elko and hopefully Nina King and, and her staff can land on the right person to take this team to the next level and keep this progression going. So a lot is still coming from the football team. It's probably going to come over the next few days, especially over the weekend, as we uh, wrap up here on this episode of the Duke Basketball Roundup. So stay with us. We'll be back after the Georgia Tech game to update you, not just on the Georgia Tech game, get your headlines in, dbrpodcast at gmail.com, but also what happens with bowl season. We hopefully will know on Sunday where we will be playing bowl games and maybe, maybe, We'll have updates in other other areas of football as well. So until then, for Jason Evans, I am Donald Wine. This is once again the DBR Podcast, and now it is time for the Duke Band to play us out and take us home. Yo, dude, have I told you where I'm going to have lunch before the Georgia Tech game? I'm going no. to the Vortex. You ever heard of the Vortex? Yes. Have you ever had a burger from the Vortex? I have. Oh, my God. Do, do you know about this, the coronary burger? Um. Oh, no, no. I, I, I did not have it, but I've heard about it. Okay. Are so, you trying it? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't really like cheese, so I can't eat it. But the uh -huh. coronary burger is a half pound burger topped with two fried eggs, four slices of cheese, five slices of bacon, and the best part, Donald, the bun. Do you know about the bun? Mm -mm. Okay. So instead of a bun, they have two fried cheese sandwiches, grilled cheese sandwiches that they use as the bun. It's like, they call, again, they call it the coronary burger. Unbelievable. I, I see people eat these things. And I'm just like, oh my God, you're going to die. It's, Jeez. it's amazing. This is the best burger in Atlanta. It's considered one of the, like the top 20, top 15 burgers in all of the country. I'm I should eat at this place all the time. I don't, but I'm I'm excited. I'm going to the vortex right before the game with a with a buddy of mine, and uh, I'm really excited about it. Well, first off, report back, but also it reminds me of um, you remember when KFC had the double down? No, you remember the that? double down? No. Okay, so the double down was like cheese, uh, cheese and bacon, and it was a sandwich. But the bun was two chicken patties. Oh, that's right. I remember that now. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like a double decker. It was like a chicken thing in the middle, like a cutlet in the middle. Now, let me tell you, Jason, this is one of the greatest sandwiches I've ever had in my life. <laughs> ever. I had it one time. Like, literally, like, I had it and I was like, man, this is so good. And you know when your body kind of tells you internally, like, yo, we don't have Don't do that again. Do not do that again. It was like, it, our body was, my body was like, Donald, you are right. That is one of the greatest things we've ever had and we will never have it again. Are, are, are we? And I'm just like, in my mind, like, no, but it's, no, no, no. We, we've had our fun exactly, and right. we're not going to do that again because that that's a disaster. We're not going to no. We So it, it's, I think the coordinator is going to be like that. Your body's going to be like, this is great, Jason. Like, it, like, like major league. This is great. Never effing do it again. Like <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs>